This is Terry Lee, Vice President of Risk for ProTech Group. Thanks for joining us today. I am with James Green, co-founder of Illuminate Advisory. James, how are you today? I'm doing great today, Terry. Thanks. That's great. It's always great to talk to you, James. James, it seems that more and more there are articles and publications telling management that it's imperative to create a culture of risk. Do you think that is a realistic goal for most organizations? Yeah, my short answer is absolutely yes. But my long answer is, does management really want a culture of risk? Or do they just want a risk program? Or do they just want to check the box? Because we found that creating a culture of risk is hard. Creating a culture of anything in an organization is hard. It takes consistent management commitment, and it takes time. And the thing we often find lacking, you have to be patient. What are your thoughts? I think you're spot on, James. I think there's a parallel to the culture of risk uh, to what's been created around cybersecurity. Think about how many years ago, pass password management was really kind of laughable. People shared passwords. They wrote them on sticky notes and stuck them on their monitors, and we joked about it. But as cyber breaches increased... The mantra of password security, phishing training, and general awareness around cyber risk, it really increased to reduce the risk of a breach. And I think that cyber, you know, it's just one aspect of risk management. Um, but I think that uh, there's a lot of parallels to what we're seeing in uh, risk culture changes. That's interesting. So let me ask you, Terry, how are your clients succeeding in creating a culture of risk? Well, that's kind of a tough one. It takes time, as you said, and patience. So I think the real results will be borne out over uh, many years. And we have some clients that have been working with us for over 15 years. And there are um, instances where we see a lot of risk cultural changes in a positive fashion. And I think that really the guiding factor is risk maturity, that risk maturity is what drives their approach. And they recognize in many cases that the organization is not mature in its thinking about risk. And so they take it slow. They introduce small changes with clearly defined metrics in order to change the culture and measure that what they're doing is working. Uh, let me give you a, a brief example. A financial services customer was preparing to go live with ProTect ERM recently, and they wanted to implement key risk indicators, but they had some concerns that the end users moving from spreadsheets to an automated platform for the first time would resist providing accurate monthly KRI data, um, which is all prompted by email workflow notifications and, and doing so in an online platform where the scale of their KRI input was instantly known, was the result good, bad, or uh, indifferent. So they set the scales um, so that there were no bad responses for the first 90 days. And they did this to get the end users engaged in using the solution and comfortable using the solution with its workflow and notifications and reporting. Each month, risk owners can submit their monthly KRI data and no one is scored low or medium. They're all just green and normal. Once comfortable with the new process, they started to implement the scales and now the users feel confident in using the solution. And they're now eager to provide the data to see their own trends over time but it took time to get there. That's really interesting that you mention those, those key performance indicators because some of the things that I've seen where organizations are successful is first, are you aligning the culture of risk with the business goals of the organization? They should right. be tied together. They shouldn't be going in, in different streams. And I always find, is management really willing to see it through? Creating a culture of risk takes more than a quarter. And then ultimately, are you willing to put your money where your mouth is? I've, the most successful organizations I've seen tie bonuses to those risk culture indicators. So we've talked a little bit about what organizations do right when creating a culture of risk. Terry, what about when organizations, and we've seen quite a few, tried to create a culture of risk and failed? Where do you think they went wrong? I think the common thread is uh, is really twofold. One, they uh, they lacked executive support. We've all heard about tone at the top and how important it is, but that executive sponsorship and buy in is uh, it really matters. It's really um, it's really useful. And then the second point is they tried to do too much too fast. 
that the risk culture, um, you know, it's how people think and talk about risk, which is seen by some as a distraction from doing their daily job. But the real issue is that they're, they don't realize that they're actually talking about risk every day. They're just not using risk terms. You don't walk into the, the uh, you know, the, the company conference room and hear people talking using words like risk and risk mitigation and risk management. They're using the language of their daily jobs and their processes. But executive support, it's really essential to change uh, any culture. What do you what do you think about that? What do you see in failed implementations of that type? Yeah, I'm I'm so glad that you mentioned executive support and buy-in for management. And that's key. Mm-hmm. One thing I'm working with a client right now that we learned, it's not just management. Do you have support from your board, from your shareholders? from your your stakeholders. I have, like I said, one client right now, management was bought into the program, but they didn't do a great job explaining it to shareholders and the board, and they kind of had a rift there. So I want people to think about not only management buy-in, but that second level management buy-in. And I love that earlier you talked about your client like not getting in trouble the first 90 days, because the other thing I've seen Mm -hmm. where people really fail is they drive solely out of a culture of fear and punishment. If you don't meet this risk goal, if you don't enter in your KPIs or KRIs, what do we usually hear? It's going to be escalated up the chain. So people do things to not get in trouble, to not uh, get punished. And those types of programs don't stick long term. You really need to explain the benefits of the program, the positive of the programs. That's a huge failure point. Uh, I want another thing I've been thinking about, I wanted to ask you about probably a loaded question, but do you think software and automation can help create a culture of risk? Well, I guess the short answer uh, is not yes, but heck yes, <laughs> considering I work for Protect. What Protect ERM does better than uh, most vendors in our space is really the fundamentals, which are essential to changing and improving risk management programs and culture. The fundamentals are things like risk assessments and care eyes and issues and findings and compliance question attestations and workflow and reporting and uh, you know, a a configurable platform so that they can keep moving without having to stop and call for software engineering support. These are the tools that can be used to change a culture. Uh, It takes time, uh, but the fundamentals have to be right to begin with. uh, Otherwise, everything else falls apart down the road. Do you think software and automation can impact risk culture? Yeah, I really do, because I find that reporting can help drive accountability. And if you're doing everything manual, by the time you figure out the reporting, you're already using stale data. And I really feel, you know, the best way to glean insight into where your organization is heading and what they're doing is quality data, is quality reporting. And it helps you make those adjustments on the fly instead of three months or six months uh, after the fact. Last question for you, Terry. We've always had a joke a couple of years ago that the cloud is just servers or the cloud is just someone else's servers. So do you think a culture of risk is a fad? Is it just the latest management buzzword? No, um, no, I, I actually, I don't think it. Uh, it's a fad. Um, in 2006, Peter Drucker said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Now, some people, myself included, have requoted that as culture eats strategy for breakfast every day of the week. Drucker believed that business leaders need to embrace this, uh, what he called the spirit of performance by displaying high levels of moral and ethical integrity in their actions, by focusing on results, by empowering employees and going beyond, beyond financial obligations Uh, and ultimately serving the common good. Business leaders have been seeking ways to improve corporate culture for for decades. And I think in many respects, we're still at the early stages of really understanding what risk culture is and how to improve it as a a journey over time. Yeah, and obviously I'm biased here because I've built my whole career on creating a culture of risks. I hope it's not a fad. But seriously, what we're seeing out in the marketplace, more and more regulators and shareholders are requiring organizations to mitigate enterprise risk. But 
in the last six months to a year, we've seen that customers are requiring you to do that as they dig into their supply chain and as they go upstream. They're, they're requiring customers more than ever before are requiring this uh, culture of risk from their vendors, from their suppliers. And I think you need that culture of risk now to stay competitor. Your competitors are going to be right. doing great work in this space. You need to you need to make sure you're keeping up with them. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, James, I'm glad you asked. It's first of all, it's always a pleasure to speak with you. I really enjoy yeah. our conversations. We're online at protectgroup.com. That's P-R-O-T-E-C-H-T group.com. I'm on LinkedIn as Terrence Lee and uh, available at terrence.lee at protectgroup.com. Uh, James, how should people reach you at Illuminate Advisory? Yeah, our website is illuminateadvisory.com or you can reach me on just about any social media known to man as the James Green. 